Well, we've got uh, some different asset classes. If you had to pick one investment to hold for 10 years plus, what would it be? Would it be gold and silver, Bitcoin, bonds, or stocks? And uh, the, the overwhelming majority said gold and silver. How long will it take uh, the Fed to lower the CPI to 2%? Three questions with troubling answers. So tell us a little bit about this article because um, it's got some really great insights. You know, Mike, I, I, I'm i an investor too, and I listen to the Fed too, just like everybody else. And when Jerome Powell insisted that he was going to get inflation down to 2%, you know, I'm an analyst. So I had some questions <laughs> about that and how realistic that is, you know. So basically, in this article, I asked three questions and go through and answer them with data, with history, you know, with the current circumstance and all that sort of thing. So uh, the first question there, Mike, has hiking rates actually lowered inflation? And you'll see I have a chart there that shows just how aggressive they've been at raising rates. They've raised rates 0.75%, four times in a row. It's the most aggressive rate hike in history now, in modern history at least. And yeah, uh, you can were see there rate hikes during the Great Depression, and the Fed broke the economy back then. They made some horrible, horrendous mistakes during the Great Depression. Uh, where they would slam up the rate like a full point at a time uh, yeah. from practically zero. Uh, and uh, But yes, this is as far as uh, how far you can go back and create charts on the Federal Reserve's website, that only goes back, the, the charts for rate hikes only go back to about World War II. <laughs> but that's long enough to... Right. That, well, that, you can see in this doing. chart that... You yeah. know, 2% is a, is a long way off, um, you know, so as, as aggressive as, as they have been, and rates are coming down a little bit. I don't know if that's really the Fed or just the slowing economy that you've pointed out many times now, uh, but 2% is a long way off. That's the whole point of that. So, and okay. then the se my second question was, can inflation's root cause be solved with higher rates? Are they using the right prescription to solve high inflation. And basically, as I point out here, as you've talked about, Mike, it's really more of a supply chain issue. Inflation is usually demand driven. This is more supply chain issues. And until the supply chain is solved, the bottom line is it's going to be very difficult for the Fed to get inflation all the way down to 2%. Do you have any comment on that? Well, supply chain issues. Yeah, well, inflation over the long run is a uh, quantity of currency. And then over the short run, there's a whole bunch of things that affect it. And it's supply and demand is, I mean, it's the reason that if you go to Colombia, uh, a cab ride from the airport to your hotel is gonna cost you millions of pesos instead of a, a hundred, you know, about a hundred bucks or whatever that is. But it, it's, it's measured in millions of pesos simply because they've printed so many pesos. <laughs> Uh, you know, things go up and down uh, over the short term uh, due to supply, demand, velocity, shortages, surpluses. Uh, so inflation becomes very complex over the short term. And supply chain disruption has kicked it off. You know, I'm, uh, my book should have been out last a month ago. And uh, there's problems with the printers, there's problems getting boxes to put the cardboard. You not only have uh, supply chain issues with the paper, but then you've got the cardboard box that you've got to put it in to be able to ship to Amazon. Then there's the truckers. They are one of the things that you have identified is uh, that supply chain issues, when you make it harder to do business and uh, Powell is going to put quite a number of businesses out of business with these higher rates. There's something right. called zombie companies uh, where they can only afford, they, they can't quite afford to make the interest payments on their debt out of current cash flow. They don't have enough profits. Well, if they've got short term debt that has to roll over and it rolls over to these higher interest rates, that puts them even, even further negative. And so some of these companies are destined for bankruptcy with these higher 
the higher rate regime that we've got. And when they go out of business, that affects the supply chain even more. Uh, and if you've got a shortage of goods, you have to bid a higher price to get that good. And so, <laughs> yes, this is a, a bad spiral. So uh, right. tell me about your analysis here of it, This because I find it fascinating. Well, the basic, the upshot of all this on that issue is that, you know, higher rates make it more difficult and more expensive to do business, not easier. So higher rates don't solve a supply chain issue. They actually make it more difficult. So yes, uh, yes. the supply chain will eventually get resolved. Yes. But the Fed's actually in the way <laughs> of resolving that with higher rates. They're making it more difficult, more expensive. So I just don't see a CPI coming down to 2% anytime soon, at least until the supply chain is completely back to normal. So, yeah. and then the, yeah. the third point, the third question I asked there, Mike, was what does history show about raising rates to uh, bring down high inflation? So I just pulled up a chart of when Paul Volcker was first hired back in 1979 when rates were really high, or, or inflation was really high. And you can see there, inflation jumped for, oh, at least another year, kept going up after he was hired. And it took a full five years for him and the Fed at that time to get inflation, the CPI, down below 3%. Five years. And some will say, well, inflation was a lot higher than, well, it's all relative, right? So um, this percentage drop in the CPI needed today is roughly the same percentage drop that they needed then. So. Um, you know, history shows that it takes a long time to bring a CPI down by raising rates. And uh, yeah, yeah. any comment on that, Mike? Well, uh, one of the things I'm noticing here is that uh, the scales on this one, we've got CPI uh, going up to 16% and over on the right hand scale, uh, Fed funds rate, uh, the range of the, the scale range goes up to 25 percent uh so actually uh it took a, a lot more pain than uh this chart even conveys um if if they were both the now if you refer to the previous chart you'll see that the cpi has a higher scale going up to 10 percent on the right side and mm. the left side Fed funds rate only goes to 4%. So we're nowhere near getting the uh, Fed funds rate above the rate of inflation. And that's ah, what it took point. for Paul, Paul Volcker to get this under control. But if you adjusted um, this and uh, made the CPI scale, instead of going up to 16, if that was going up to 25 so that they were equal, what you would see is that um, the Fed funds rate had to go significantly above the rate of inflation for any of this to start coming down. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, it went down to uh, 3% or 3.5 by 83, and then in 84 bounced back up over 4%. They don't have the control that they think. I mean, that's it, thank you. That's the whole point of this article. They can't yeah. control it as much as they think they can, and it takes longer than they think it'll take. That's the whole point. Yeah. Look at what central bankers themselves are doing. And Mike, this was astonishing to me that central bankers now are buying in record amounts. In fact, year to date, they've bought more gold. Central bankers have bought more gold so far in 2022 than any year since 1967. In 1967, you'll remember, gold was backed, uh, the dollar was backed by gold. That's how long it's been that, since they've bought this much gold. So yeah. that's a clear message, I think, from central bankers. Yes, it is. <laughs> if they're uh, buying gold, it's interesting. Uh, they, um, they're taking action uh, early compared to what the public is doing right now, the public isn't paying attention. But uh, I, I really think that uh, the this, I don't know how long this is going to last, whether it's uh, just a couple of months or six months or a year, but uh, this is the time to accumulate before 
the results, the de, you know, this delay of, of an input, stepping on the accelerator and nothing ha happens until the, the, uh, you know, the mixture in the engine richens up, the revs start to build, the transmission kicks down, and then suddenly the car lunges forward. Well, we're still in that uh, stage where the transmission is kicking down and stuff from all of the currency creation that they did, and then the supply chain disruptions on top of them. And uh, so you've to get ahead of this, to me, is important. I would rather be uh, a decade early than one day too late, because when it's too late, it's too late. Well, we've got uh, some different asset classes. If you had to pick one investment to hold for 10 years plus, what would it be? Would it be gold and silver, Bitcoin, bonds, or stocks? And uh, the, the overwhelming majority said gold and silver. Bitcoin came in at one third. Uh, it's interesting. Stocks came in at less than eight and a half percent and bonds <laughs> down at 1.3%. But the new uh, poll that we've put out there is the same poll, but it, we've added that you have to also be able to sleep soundly at night. We have just been through a huge disruption in the crypto sector that, uh, I mean, you know, I am so glad that throughout the years, I've been taking profits from crypto and buying real metals. I just like this physical thing that has, it's three-dimensional, it has mass, you know, you can hold it, it's, it's heavy. Uh, uh, and so I've been taking a virtual asset, cryptos, and when I've got profits, uh, taking some of those profits and converting them into uh, real precious metals. And recently, the cryptos have just fallen off of a cliff. The precious metals protected the wealth that I stored in them uh, when I took those profits.